there to kind of help you back in. But yeah, it's 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 hopefully it's a culmination. It's the point where the player feels they've beaten the game. They've they've worked something out a bit quicker than the game was willing to show them. Um, which uh, I don't know how often that works, but it, it feels like the right time to introduce this mechanic in in terms of actually having to force the player to do it. Um, and yeah, it's 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 interesting. The, the the gravity thing started off as a bug. Um, it started off that basically the two characters when I was because obviously on paper I was like, oh, Thomas would be cool if he could jump, and it'd be cool if there was another character that jumps the wrong way. The anti gravity thing. But I never actually worked out what would happen if the two landed on top of each other. And it was only then when I got these characters into the game and put them together, I jumped them on top of each other and realised that they cancel each other out. It was very buggy. I had to tweak a few things, but it was. It was really interesting and, and it made complete sense in a really weird kind of game logic -y way, which which I liked. Um, so I went with it. Um, and I, I think it's fun. I think it kind of defines these levels quite nicely. I love double jumping in games. It feels nice. It adds a kind of a tactical choice element to jumping, which is which is quite cool. And and that's why Sarah's in the game. I wanted to get one of them in. Um, she also kind of kicks up the tempo. Uh, she's there to introduce a new mechanic, which which changes the way the game's played. But also, from a story point of view, she kind of is the reason that everything gets pushed towards the climax it does. That she's basically there as an agent, pushing the story forward, uh, setting up the uh, the goals of the characters from that point on. Um, and she's also epic. of getting a little bit of exploration into the game so looking around and, and, and seeing what was going on um, obviously it's kind of hard to do in a puzzle platformer without the player kind of feeling like they've missed the point or got lost um, and the idea of hunting for things became cool and I had these switches so I thought okay I'll make a level where you move around hunting down the switches and, and jumping on them in order to, to progress um, and I made this level but the problem is with the playtesters they got lost they got confused as to where they were meant to be going what they were meant to be doing and it, it just it frustrated people and it didn't feel like a, a puzzle or a game level because it was so unguided and, and it just felt boring the the kind of the spotlight was um a weird side effect i'd made spotlights uh for another part of the game and then removed decided that they weren't quite working and removed them and this was a perfect opportunity to find a new use for a spotlight so it's kind of moving around at the, at the start of the level it feels like an aesthetic thing and you look around and then once you realize it's tied into where the switches are it becomes a waypoint system kind of for that one level just at something to point you this this puzzle here is about teaching the player to do something that's a bit counterintuitive um, if you're not uh, if you're not someone who's played many uh, puzzle platformers and and to be fair with some puzzle platformers this doesn't work but something I really wanted Sarah to be able to do was this kind of slingshot move. So you would jump her in one direction and then use the double jump to push her back in the direction um, you came from. The idea being that you could kind of avoid an obstacle in midair, so you could jump around something. Um, this is a really kind of, hopefully, a really kind of straightforward blank canvas for you to try that move out of it's kind of like sarah was probably the, the kind of the hardest character to write for because she's kind of got this whole epic thing going on she kind of feels she should hopefully feel a bit tolkien-esque a bit kind of <laughs> a bit like she's walked in from game of thrones um i kind of wanted her to feel aloof and different to the other characters in the scene kind of sort of like thor i guess in, in the marvel comics that she just sounds a bit off and a bit uncomfortable around everyone else as a result um, but doesn't realize how weird she sounds um, getting that right was really hard making it so that that didn't seem weird or you know getting unintentional laughs from it was odd I think most of the time we stay on just the right side but it was a, it was a challenge and it kind of distances her which I quite like I quite like that she feels kind of separate from the group um, and I think a lot of that's achieved by the writing and by by the way Danny performed the part
so yeah so with this level it's really about kind of targeting a space uh, vertically this is something that i've not required you to do before and you can't really do without sarah there's a gap that you have to get through which if you get it slightly wrong in either direction you'll die um, and it forces you to really think spatially about where that jump's placed, where you use that second jump in order to keep yourself out of harm's way. Um, it's again, it's it's teaching the player to finesse. Um, hopefully, it's teaching them to play Sarah in a way that they they actually think about where they're going and they use that space and use the the character's ability to to get the perfect jump to specifically. This is a weird one. This is actually, this level is an excellent example of something very odd that happens. I've talked to other indies and it, it happens to most indies. When you're working in a studio, you obviously you're sat in a professional environment, an office, um, you're surrounded by pros and you get the job done and maybe you listen to music, but you just kind of get on with it. With Thomas, I designed it, I built it at home. Um, so, and I was sat next to my, my television at home on my computer and I like background noise, so I put films on. And weirdly, this specific level I made while watching some obscure old Robert Downey Jr. movie. So for me, this level immediately, it's not, this is no insight on the game design, and I apologize for wasting your time, but this level always makes me think of Robert Downey Jr. <laughs> and it's weird how those kind of, <laughs> it's, it's a weird phenomenon that indies often, like bits of games that we worked on, will be colored by whatever movie we had on or whatever TV show we had playing while we were working on that level. So this, this level for me is Robert Downey Jr.'s level. No insight at all on the, on the game design there. Wasting your time. So this, this is kind of the place where that, that balancing two characters on top of each other mechanic kind of gets made more uh, complex. So you have a third character in it that you have to kind of factor in in your choices. And you have to kind of carry one character across, switch, and, and take the other one back. Uh, you also can uh, die to get the achievement there in the uh, in the bottom corner, um, <laughs> but it's it's really um, it's really about just extrapolating on that concept that you learned and mastered earlier, and and just taking it off in a, in a different direction, and this time with Sarah to to make that a bit more interesting. This is the Fountain of Knowledge or Wisdom, depending on, <laughs> on which bit of dialogue uh, I'm, I'm using at that specific point. And this was a this was a cool thing. I'm quite proud of this one. 
Um, this was this had to be a big moment because this is the moment where Thomas kind of becomes self-aware. This is the moment where they realize the context they're in, they realize about the outside world, and it kind of establishes that. It's also a chance to do a really big, cool particle effect, which I which I'm quite proud of. Um, interesting little bit of trivia: the images that are flowing past there are the Twitter avatars of all of my Twitter followers who replied yes please to a tweet from me saying would you like to be in a particle effect in Thomas Was Alone. Um, <laughs> 69 uh, actually was a, an attempt to go back uh, to that earlier level, that, the level I think I described it as jazzy, um, where the environment's changing, but this time let the player change their environment. Um, so the player's kind of forming the level for themselves here. So you move the platforms into position by pressing switches, which allows another character to get to a new switch, which they can then use to get to a new switch. And there's a nice kind of progression and back and forth through the level. This was also, from a game designer point of view, this was a really fun level to put together because I had to work out kind of the geometry that would allow for this so that you had this world changing, but the nothing broke and it looked cool in all of its formations. And it was it was a it was a really fun level to make. I hope it's as fun to play as it was to make, as it's uh, it was a, it was an interesting challenge to make all those pieces look good and move around in a, in a fun way. Building on the idea of, of the player kind of editing their environment, this was another idea. This was one of those experiential things where it didn't really come from a puzzle per se. It, became, it came from an idea that I thought would be quite fun visually and from a player perspective. So this is this is a box which gets smaller and smaller and smaller as you as you interact with it and kind of compresses the the, uh, the player characters down in, in, in space. Um, it just it felt really r nice mechanically. I got into a stage with some of these levels around this area where it became about making the level really interesting in the way that it moved or changed and trying to achieve kind of an aesthetic, emotive sense to these levels. Because by this point the player knows the mechanics so it can, I can, I'm freer to do that. Um, I don't do so these levels um, coming up, the, the objective here was to, to complete all of the character arcs because, um, as you know, spoilers, um, this is the point where we, we actually leave these characters behind. And all of them have a journey they have to go on, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit more as we go through, but essentially the first character to deal with is Thomas, is Thomas's, Thomas's journey, and, and no one gets this except for, like, there's like three or four people, and and that's my failing, that's absolutely my failing, but what I, what I was going for, what I was hoping people would kind of take away from Thomas, is Thomas is a creative, he's someone who um, wants to make... Uh, well, he doesn't start off wanting to make stuff that's cool. He's very interested in the world. He he sees things. He's observant. He's he's having fun just looking at the world. And then he kind of discovers that he doesn't like certain things about this world. And that's the point during these levels where he decides to change things. He decides to create something, and he and he creates um, these new characters who go on to to achieve what he wanted to achieve originally. And it's nice. It feels it feels like a nice kind of illustration of that creative process of kind of. Creative people tend to, at least the ones I've met, tend to be really, really interested in everything. And I kind of like the idea, it's not part of the process that I've not, I've really seen depicted. And I kind of like the idea of Thomas being that guy, that guy who has to know why that thing works the way it does and, and is, is intrigued by the world around him. Um, and I don't think the players necessarily realize that straight away, but I, like, I hope that during these kind of levels, you realize that that's the journey Thomas has come on um, towards kind of becoming a creative or a creator.
so uh, this is this is a chance to do something that I'm surprised I didn't I don't do much of in the game up to this point, and I think I I would probably go back and do a little bit more of it. Is moving targets. Is having targets where time is a factor um, in in the placement as well. So here it's really simple. I I, I basically have two position sets. Um, and you just have to move your characters into one of those sets, which is fine. What's interesting is because the sets keep moving, most players, as they're putting this together, lose track of which set they're trying to build, and, and that's where the puzzle comes in, is just paying attention to which, which layout you're, you're attempting. Uh, both are possible, obviously, um, but doing half of one and half of the other is, is not, <laughs> not going to win you the level. So it's, it's a fun one from that point of view. It kind of plays with players' perceptions a little bit. It's also quite a nice one-screen level. Um, there's not many of these in the game, but I do like pulling them out every now and again. It just It's a nice way of, of mixing things up a bit. And, and aesthetically, I just really like one level, um, one level, one screen. Um, and that's how the, the Flash game worked, of course.
So the other story to um, that they, they needed to be kind of continued and completed was this story of how John reacts to Sarah. Um, is that Sarah basically is John, but more so. Um, and I really like the idea of him being massively intimidated at first by that and jealous, but actually that that freeing him a little bit because he doesn't need to be insecure because there is someone who's demonstrably better at jumping than he is. Um, and he kind of comes to terms with that and likes the idea of making other people feel awesome about themselves. He becomes much more selfless. He starts off very selfishly at the start of the game and through his interactions with Sarah becomes the selfless character, which is which is really cool. Um, and, and obviously at the very end of these levels where he's useless um, to this new, there are no yellow um, tr uh, trigger zones later on. This is, he is not going to be a part of this kind of, this success. And he's kind of okay with that because he feels he's facilitated it and he's helped out with it. So that's a nice journey. And I like the way John progresses and I like the way that his story ends. not accept that this had all been futile. She was a superhero. There had to be a way. Not for her to get out. Red had been pretty clear on that, but there must be thousands of other AIs up there, unaware of their situation. Was there a way to help them?
I mentioned earlier the um, how late the checkpoints came in, um, and that that was a very late addition to the game. And I kind of I think I pointed out that was pretty stupid. Um, this is the mechanic I added two weeks before launch. Um, I was I I I was playing um, I was playing for the first time. I tried FIFA. I was playing a football video game, not playing football, um, and I, I hated it, but I liked the idea of a ball, and it kind of rooted in my mind, and I wanted to add a ball to Thomas, and I didn't want to, it wasn't going to go in too many levels, but I liked the idea of having one or two places where it fit, and I knew that during these kind of levels, it's, you have been with the same characters for a little while, so introducing a new, mecha a new mechanic kind of felt logical and felt like it would be good for the player's kind of sanity. So the ball obviously became a diamond because curves do not exist in this universe. Um, and it, it became quite a cool little physics object you bounce around. It caused quite a few headaches in terms of the way character interactions work. Because physics in Thomas is not realistic. It's kind of, like, it's not realistic obviously because it's a video game jump. But actually more so than that, in terms of when you carry characters, the fact that they don't slide off you, for example. So there's quite a bit of um, tweaks and fiddling going on behind the scenes to make the game feel the way I want it to feel. And the ball kind of contradicts a lot of that. So it became, a little bit, <laughs> it became quite a bit more challenging than I thought it was going to be. But it actually adds, I think, a lot to these last few levels of, of, with these characters that you... You play with it in an interesting way. The fact that it's uh, got the diagonals on it means that the way you interact with it is kind of akin to a football, that you're kind of bouncing it around the level and and kind of specifically kind of hitting it from different sides in order to change its direction, things like that. Um, and the big challenge, actually, is working out how to make it interact with the existing systems in the game. Making it a specific uh, Switch variant was the kind of the perfect solution. That It felt logical, the player understood it, um, and it used... Uh, Kind of a, it, it used a way of communicating that had been set up before in a nice way, and it fits into the existing systems. This is similar to some of the stuff I do um, earlier in the game with um, with multiple uh, areas with different characters interacting indirectly. But what's nice about the ball um, was that it allowed me to make levels like this one, where you have multi you have different characters in different areas interacting with one object that gets moved around and passed around um, in different ways. Um, and, and that was cool because it meant I could kind of separate the characters but have an object that moves between them. Because you don't directly control the ball, it becomes a kind of a passive object in the world that you have to interact with in interesting ways. It's basically kind of like, I guess, the companion cube from Portal. But it becomes something that 
takes on a meaning because it's something that's passed between different characters in this in this scene. Um, so yeah, I really like this level. I never did get on the bottom right of the water, the particle effect kind of bleeds out of the wall, and I hate that. I never got that right, and I never worked out how to fix that problem. So yeah, half finished game. <laughs> So this is similar to some of the stuff I do um, earlier in the game with um, with multiple uh, areas with different characters interacting indirectly. But what's nice about the ball um, was that it allowed me to make levels like this one, where you have multi you have different characters in different areas interacting with one object that gets moved around and passed around um, in different ways. Um, and and that was cool because it meant I could kind of separate the characters, but have an object that moves between them. Because you don't directly control the ball, it becomes a kind of a passive object in the world that you have to interact with in interesting ways. It's basically kind of like, I guess, the companion cube from Portal, but it becomes something that takes on a meaning because it's something that's passed between different characters in this in this scene. Um, so yeah, I really like this level. I never did get on the bottom right of the water, the particle effect kind of bleeds out of the wall, and I hate that. I never got that right, and I never worked out how to fix that problem. So yeah, half finished game. So this was a point where I realised that there was an interesting possibility for an interaction between uh, Sarah and Laura. I've not played with those two before. Because Sarah has that mid-air jump, um, if she bounces once and then um, jumps in mid-air, you actually get some quite interesting movement out of her. So the idea of an environment where you could play with that, where you kind of combined the bounce with the secondary jump, uh, felt cool. And that's what this level became. And it weirdly becomes uh, Pong. <laughs> or Breakout or any of those kind of games and in a way that I really like. It's kind of nostalgic um, and it, it kind of works. It's it's fun. It's um, it's a little bit repetitive potentially, but I, I do like it and I, I really, really like the nod to Pong.
Laura, had been born special. She understood that now. She was created to help others. If her bounce could be passed on, then this would all have been worthwhile. So this is another area where the characters are kind of divided. I had quite a bit of, I, it was quite an important piece of story here. This is the moment where Thomas does decide to, to basically change the world. <laughs> um, so I deliberately kept this one pretty simple. This isn't a very challenging environment. It's more of just somewhere for you to interact with and exist for a for a little while until we get, um, so, so basically so you can hear the story beat. Um, there's a couple of places in the game where I deliberately kind of slow the pace while something important is being said in the story. Uh, this is just a good example of one such place where it was important to kind of step back and, and let that let that dialogue from Danny, which I'm talking over right now, um, play out so you can just see what's going on. I, I loved, as a kid, the game Mousetrap. And <laughs> this is kind of my ode to Mousetrap. Um, it's similar to a couple of the other levels that you've got kind of a sequence of different characters interacting with the same ball, but here it's much more specifically uh, a journey that ball's going on from one end of the level to another. Um, and that feels, I really like this level. Um, it's, like I said, it's a nod to Mousetrap. It's kind of, it takes you in some interesting directions. There's also some quite cute um, ideas in there around the kind of, when the, the, that little lever that kind of flips the ball upwards that you catch in midair with James, stuff like that just, just kind of grew out organically as the level was being designed. Um, and it just feels nice. It's, it feels it feels sufficiently different in terms of the way you interact with it than, than any previous level. Um, and it, again, it goes back to that kind of thing I was talking about earlier of the experiential element. That this is this level's so much more about how it feels than how challenging it is to work out. Massive jumps were dwarfed by Sarah. For the first time in his life, he felt humbled, not as good as someone else. He realized that he wanted to make every AI up there feel as heroic as he had. He liked the sound of that.
Okay, so this is again kind of still riffing off the idea of, of characters in separate rooms. Um, but what's cool here is the the approach has been to take um, to make those several rooms um, join together. So you're kind of opening up the space, and the characters kind of overlap in interesting ways. This one was really about the um, the way the paths work for the characters. So you feel like you've really travelled this space. Um, you take characters from one end to another, you take some characters just slightly over to the side. Um, you've got Laura and Sarah there just kind of on their own, bouncing away um, as a nice little metronome for the level. You've got kind of a um, an interesting journey for each of the characters in this level, um, and they're all overlapping, so it's kind of, it's a level that feels really good because it's they're separate, but they're also kind of overlapping constantly, um, and some of the puzzles require require more than one of them at once. So this is the last, the last environment for these characters, um, which is was a controversial choice on my part, um, <laughs> to say the least. Um, this is the point where they essentially overcome what they are. They become heroes. Um, you know, uh, Claire passes on her skill. Sarah passes on hers. Laura passes on hers. Um, oh my god, I just realized that most of the characters that give up their passes, their powers selflessly are female. I don't know what I was trying to say there. Except James. James is, James is male, so that ruins any reading like that. <laughs> um, and and it's, it's a nice moment where basically I like, I hope that most players assume that this is a game about um, characters escaping. I, I, I hope that most players assume when they start the game that the last level will be Thomas escaping. Um, and I like to subvert that. I like the fact that these characters don't get out. That they they become part of the system. That they essentially give give themselves so that the others can escape. There's there's a certain kind of heroism there. There's almost a mythical quality of them kind of um, sacrificing themselves for for their kind. Um, it also had to feel pretty epic. So that kind of final moment, um, the where the characters step into uh, the Matrix. There is a um, there is a uh, hopefully a cool feeling to that. They're also the way they're arranged um, means that the characters whose traits are not carried over are not in the uh, in the particle effect, not in the in the matrix itself. They're kind of out to the side, which probably no one notices, but is a nice little moment for for just kind of establishing what might happen next. I didn't want to make it clear how they were going to affect the world, um, so I couldn't say too much at this point. But I hope that on the second playthrough, players kind of spot that all when they listen to this.
and this is Grey. Um, this is a new character. I'm not sure what what players expect. I kind of I hope that they the ones that have been paying attention kind of uh, realize that the characters up to this point are now gone. Um, I wonder if some of them think that this is going to be a continuation like before. Um, but hopefully that loss kind of sets in. With Grey, um, there's a few things about Grey that are important. One is he's Grey. <laughs> um, he's, and that's that's actually a functional thing that all these characters are Grey because their their colours once they start to gain their abilities um, needed to show up. So they so Grey became a logical thing. So they're all shades of Grey. Um, having the first character introduced coloured Grey, um, I think kind of helps that to take a little bit longer to sink in, so players kind of um, just accept that the character's called Grey. Um, Grey is is an interesting character here because he is essentially the fall from grace. He starts off kind of optimistic, a little bit arrogant. So Joe and Sam are the couple, um, <laughs> kind of long-term couple of the game. Um, it's 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 an in they're interesting. They have a, a good relationship. Um, uh, Joe starts off a little bit, um, uh, I guess, whiny. But, but but coming around very quickly um and and they're they're cool the purpose of this level obviously is to kind of build on what we've just seen with gray and introduce the idea of these two characters uh shifting their abilities um the fact that you can shift to an ability for one character without shifting the ability of the other things like that just kind of extrapolating on the learning from the previous level hopefully in an environment that's pretty safe um, the only skill that's required in this level is jumping, and obviously by this point you you know how to jump. The, the whole game's kind of trained you in that. So again, hopefully kind of a safe environment in which to learn. Um, water obviously had to be there, so there had to be some hazard. But, but again, hopefully that's mitigated.